To avoid unwanted YouTube ads, we encourage you to watch this video via the link in the video description below. 3,000 years ago, King David wrote these words, Psalm 145, verse 1, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Our God is good, and he is worthy of all of our praises. Good morning. Welcome to Awake Us Now. Thank you for joining us as we gather together this morning to reflect on God's word, to worship him, to praise his glorious name. I'd invite you to join with me now in a word of prayer, and then we're going to take a look at his word together. Heavenly Father, we honor and bless you. We thank you for your incredible goodness. We praise you for your amazing brilliance, and we rejoice in your unfailing love and mercy. May your Holy Spirit speak to each of us this day through your powerful word of truth. May the Lord Jesus, our Savior and returning King, be exalted. And may we be drawn to you as never before. Amen. Well, we are continuing with a series of messages entitled Rekindle. And this morning we're going to take a look at one of the most important sections of Scripture found anywhere in the Bible one that we've looked at for the past two weeks as well. It's the Great Commission of Jesus, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Perhaps you're saying to yourself, well, Chris, we've already talked about that quite a bit. I will respond by saying, so have I, uh, and have done that for years. I was originally called as an evangelism pastor. Believe me, the Great Commission is something that I've taught, preached, spoken, memorized, proclaimed, reflected on. It's a great word. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Those are great words. And in all honesty, until a little over a week ago, I thought I knew him really well. Last week, we talked about verses 19 and the first half of 20, where Jesus gives us the imperative, make disciples. I chose my words very carefully when I talked about that imperative, because just hours before I shared those words, I was led to something that I've never seen before. It's extremely humbling, but I believe it's also extremely powerful. As I've mentioned, I've taught the Great Commission for decades. I always thought the Great Commission had a single imperative, make disciples. I was wrong, and here's how I learned that. As I often do, before delivering a message or even before preparing a message or once it's prepared, I often go for a walk. And I have found over the years that walking and talking with God is just a, a special blessing and something that I really thoroughly enjoy. I find something else. He often talks to me on those walks and shares things that I frankly would not have seen. Here is how the walk went a little over a week ago. I uh, was walking along and I was rehearsing my message and talking to God about it. And then I actually said to him, I'm going to tell them there is one imperative in the Great Commission, make disciples. And here's what I heard in my spirit, not audibly, but it was very clear. What I heard was this, are you sure? <laughs> well, I thought I was, but let me tell you, when I came home, I looked at it again and I saw something that, frankly, I've never seen before. Even though I've read those words in English, in Greek, and in other languages as well. Here's what I saw. There's one more imperative. What the Lord revealed on the walk is really true. There's another imperative in the Great Commission, and I've always missed it. Not only that, I was trained to miss it. 
Because you see, the word is the Greek word idu. It's often referred to with a grammatical term. It's called a particle. Uh, scholars, Bible students, students of Greek refer to it as a Hebraism, a, a case of using a Greek word, but by a person who speaks Hebrew as his native language. And we know that many times if a person is raised with one language, even when they learn another, they often carry over patterns of speech into that new language. I used to laugh about that when I was a little kid and visited with some of my relatives on my mom's side. A number of them had grown up in a very tight-knit German community. And so even though they had lived in the USA all of their lives, one of my great aunts in particular spoke like she just came off the boat. You would have assumed that she grew up in Germany, but she grew up with German. And so as a kid, I would snicker when she would suggest that maybe I should go and walk the block once around to burn off some energy. Or when she would talk about things down on the farm out in the country and say, we ought to throw the cow over the fence some hay. And as a kid, I just giggle about that. And as a Greek student, going through college and seminary, I was taught that a do is a Hebraism, and it's just a particle. It's used frequently, especially in two of the Gospels, in Matthew and in Luke. Both Matthew and Luke use this Hebraism. In Matthew, I counted it this past week, 62 times it's used there. When it's translated, and I might add, Many times, in many of our translations, it's not even translated. But when it's translated, it's usually translated like this. Lo, as in, lo, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Or, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Sometimes different translations are used. But I was taught, this is a particle, it's a Hebraism, and therefore, I never really looked at it all that closely. But after my walk on the trail, when I heard in my spirit, are you sure? I went back and I took a really careful look at this. This word is another imperative. In fact, it's a very unique Greek imperative. It's what's called, to get technical, an aorist middle imperative. And that's significant, and you'll see why. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't see the word lo or behold here in the Great Commission. Where, where is that word in our translation? And the answer is right here. In the NIV, it's translated surely, surely. But as I said, in Greek, and Matthew was written in Greek, it is an aorist middle imperative which means it's a command that applies especially to you and me personally. An aorist middle imperative says, do this for yourself. And the Greek word literally means, look at this for yourself. Or even more effectively, and I believe closer to the, uh, the actual intent, it means remember this. Remember this. It's a one-time command to never forget this for yourself. What Jesus is saying is, remember this. Remember this. Why? Because he says, I am with you always. You do not have to live in fear. You do not have to tremble when the difficulties of life come your way. You do not have to wonder, is God going to see me through this? You do not have to be afraid that this is going to turn out in such a way that it will be absolutely irredeemable. Jesus says, remember this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. But there's something else here. Something else that's highly significant when you look at the original text. It's not just remember this. 
Jesus says, I am with you. But in the Greek text, it is even more significant and more dramatic. If we translate it literally, it's I myself am with you. And what Jesus is saying to us here is remember this. Keep this in mind. Don't let this depart from you. Remember this. I myself am with you. And I'm with you to the very end of the age. As I look at the Great Commission, and frankly, as the Lord has brought me to this in the last days, I find myself even more in awe of God. And let's be honest, in this short commission, Jesus covers all the bases. He covers truly all the bases. Because once again, if we translate things literally from the original text, here's what we see. Jesus says, and he uses the same word. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All the authority is his. We talked about that. The fact that all authority belongs to Jesus means when he speaks, not only should we listen, but we can listen with confidence because all the authority is his. And his mission, he tells us, is to make disciples of what? All nations every one of them, every people group imaginable. It seems like an impossible task, but he tells us all authority is his. And then he says, teach them to obey all things that I have commanded you. He is calling us to impart to others, to our families, to our friends, to our neighbors, to unbelieving co-workers, to people we meet in random situations. We are called to bear witness to him in our lives. And we are called to share with those around us all the things he has taught us and to practice them. But more than that, our translation says, I will be with you always but the original text literally reads, I will be with you all the days. I will be with you all the days until what? Until all the days come to the end, to the very end of the age. What Jesus is promising us is that he will be with us. He will empower us. He will watch over us and we can count on his presence. And that, dear friends, is something that every disciple of Jesus, irrespective of age, background, location, language, you name it, every one of us need to hear. I know that many of you who are watching this now are individuals who are going through tough times. I know here in America, it is becoming increasingly difficult to express Christian truth in our culture. I also know that many of you who will be watching this are watching this in places where it is incredibly dangerous and frankly, deadly to be a follower of Jesus. And I believe what Jesus is saying to each and every one of us here brings comfort, but brings more than that, it brings strength. He speaks truth. He always does. And he promises his own that he will be with us. Remember this, always with you to the very end of the age, all the days. You know, as I look back on my own life, I've seen a number of his words in the scriptures that have especially spoken to me. And I'd like to just share four of them in particular with you today. The first, Jesus' words in John 14, verse 18, words he spoke to his disciples on the last night before he was betrayed, arrested, and then crucified, and before he rose from the grave. He said to his disciples who were worried, what's gonna happen next? He says, I will not leave you as orphans. He will not abandon us, and he will not abandon you. You know, throughout the ages, untold millions of believers have come to see how true that is in some of the toughest situations and toughest times of life. I know myself how 
His presence has made a huge difference in my life in some of the most difficult of circumstances. I know something else. He does not simply give us happy talk. He speaks the truth and it's comforting truth. John 15 verse 20, Jesus says, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Some of you are going through times of persecution from your family, from coworkers, from fellow students. Some of you are under persecution from people who live in your town or your city or your village because they hate what you believe and they hate you as a result. And Jesus says, don't be surprised. If they hated the Son of God, the most loving, caring human being who ever walked on the face of the earth, God in human flesh with us, if they hated Him, it shouldn't surprise us that they will persecute us. On a number of occasions in my life, I've seen how true His comfort is, even in situations like that. I remember a time many years ago when I was still in college, witnessing on the street to a stranger, coming back to my dorm and getting mugged, being beaten up and being what I felt at that time was pretty close to death. But I also remember the supernatural peace of God that came over me in that situation and what a comfort it was and what a comfort it continues to be. I know something else. I know what it's like to be vilified for speaking forthrightly and truthfully about the God of the Bible. You know, religious people want a God they are comfortable with, but the living God is not comfortable. He's a comforter, but he's not comfortable. And people want to control God instead of be controlled by him. And it's no surprise then that those who really do desire to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit are going to experience opposition from the most unlikely of sources, seemingly religious individuals. Jesus says, don't be surprised. And the Apostle Paul, who endured an awful lot of that, <laughs> he gives us this encouragement. Love these words, Romans 8, verse 18. The Apostle Paul writes and says, I consider our present sufferings not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us because Jesus keeps his word. Remember this for yourself. I myself am with you all the days. And finally, Hebrews 13 verse 5, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Our God is dependable. Our Savior is one in whom we can not only and trust our lives and our eternal destinies, but one whom we can rely on, his presence with us, even in the most difficult of circumstances and times. And as a result, he gives us great comfort here in this great commission. But you know what? He gives us even more because Jesus, before he left, gave these words, prophetic words to his followers, not just to the 12, not just to people living in the 30s and 40s of the first century, but to believers of all time, in all places, until he returns. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. His Holy Spirit gives us supernatural strength, power, conviction, comfort, guidance, direction, so that you and I can do what Jesus has called us to do. He has all the authority. He calls us to all the nations. He reminds us to share all that he has taught. And he tells us he will be with us all the time. And as I reflect on those things, then this commission just takes on even more power and supernatural power in my life and in yours. Shall we read those words together? 
all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And that, my dear friends, is the word of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we receive these words. We thank you for your incredible goodness, for your amazing brilliance, and for your divine presence in our lives. To you be the glory. Great things you have done and great things you are doing and great things you will do. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Should we talk about these things? It's a good thing to do. <laughs> Just get it started. What comfort does the Lord Jesus have for you in Matthew 28, 20b? And surely I'm with you always. Or remember this, I am with you all the days. And why should we remember this? What especially comes to your mind as you reflect on that? What's going on in your life that makes those words very, very personally significant right now? And finally, how have you experienced the Lord's presence in your life? Sharing those things with one another brings encouragement and strength to every one of us. And that too is a good thing.